Well, good morning, everybody. How is your enthusiasm, spunk, motivation? <laughs> I've got great news for you. I'm passionate about this topic. Some of you perhaps go, hmm, ethics. Well, how does that fit into operations? I'm passionate about operations as well. And the really cool thing that I've come to appreciate over the years is that they're inextricably linked. And so that will be my objective today is to bridge the theory of ethics to the practice of ethics at a very individual level. It starts with a basic premise. You've talked about it, I suspect, in lots of different ways, but how do you defeat an enemy? What is defeating an enemy? You know, to defeat an enemy, we need to break his will to resist. But invariably, when you're talking about the United States of America, we're not talking about simply defeating the enemy. Our strategic end state goes well beyond that. It says, hey, we want enduring peace to be an outcome of this conflict. And moreover, we want that enduring peace to be characterized by reconciliation with that enemy. And from that perspective, you've got to change that phrase. Break the will of the enemy to include break the will of the enemy to resist righteously. That means that the conflict has to be a just war. And that our conduct of it must be above reproach. And so the implications are immense in that regard. We in the naval profession... When we grasp that, we realize that we must conduct the war ethically, and as we often say, ethics are defined as our code of conduct. And I believe that the extent to which ethics consistently govern, and that's important, consistently govern our conduct, to the extent that which our ethics consistently govern our conduct, that will be strategically decisive. And it's incumbent upon us as an organization, as the squadrons and ships and strike groups that comprise our organization, the Navy, all the way down to the individual embrace this. Because we can see through events like Abu Ghraib how the actions of just one or a few individuals can change the entire tenor of the righteousness of the conduct of the conflict. And so today what I want to do is springboard from that and say you've heard the basic premise that says, hey, we need to train the way we fight. And I would submit to you that we need to conduct ourselves the way we intend to fight each and every day, ethically so that it becomes habitual. It's not something that we pull out on the day we get the go order. It's something that is ingrained in our DNA. And moreover, what I hope to do today is bridge the gap from theory to practice, practical actions to enhance not, also, not only operational effectiveness, but our ethical conduct of conflict. Uh, and I propose that we can do that by simply remembering two questions and applying them day for day, hour for hour, minute for minute to every task that we undertake in the naval profession. And those two questions are simply, am I doing the right thing? And am I doing things right? And if you view each decision through those two lenses, I believe that you'll begin to build a foundation of ethical behavior that is not only habitual, but because it consistently governs your actions, it will allow you to contribute to achieving strategic end states that are of great importance to the nation. This is a pitch that I'm delighted to be here to share with you. It's the first time that I've done it wearing a suit. So if I feel a little bit or appear a little bit discombobulated, it's only that. This is a sharing 
of intimate thoughts in many respects that I did as a three and a four star with every single staff that helped me to command organizations, both international NATO staffs as well as U.S. staffs. As a strike group commander, I gave it to my staff and my subordinate commanders. So this is a pitch that I gave to my subordinate commanders as well. And it was designed to say, these are my expectations. This is what I believe. And these are keys to success in conducting effective warfare. I viewed it predominantly through the eyes of here's how to be operationally effective and efficient. Uh, But as I think you'll see, integral to many, many of the elements of operational effectiveness is an ethical foundation. And I challenge you that over the course of this morning to dig deep on each one of these points and see if you can pull out that ethical thread. And I'll help along the way. And then at the end, I'll have reserved some time for questions. So don't hesitate to save those rounds and and fire freely at the end. Next slide, please. So I suspect at the Navy War College that you've examined this issue in some depth. What is the best approach to organizational leadership in our naval profession. And I think you've probably reached the conclusion through teaching and considerations that a commander-centric command is most effective in war fighting. And I would recommend to you that you resolve today to make that your model that you will, in fact, assume the full mantle of leadership when you're assuming positions of command, and you will work to build a commander-centric command. There are some things to contemplate when you make that decision and then move forward to achieve it. Let's start by looking at, well, what's a a staff-centric organization look like? The fact of the matter is, that authority and responsibility is distributed throughout the staff. The staff exercises perhaps a disproportionate amount of authority. And internal to that staff, people respect the commanding officer, but their allegiance is a little less unified, tends to be fractured across the department within which they're operating. The subordinate commands and and lateral commands, those that are off to the left and to the right of you in that org chart, realize that to get answers, they frequently have to go to a number of different touch points within your organization. And importantly, in the context of our conversation this morning, the ethical foundation of the organization tends to be the least common denominator amongst the department heads, that people will shop and say, hey, who is going to be my ethical role model? And in this case, in a staff-centric organization, they have a choice. Is it going to be their department head or that department head or the chief of staff or the commander? And I would propose to you that that is not the foundation that you want, either for effective command and control of the operation, nor for setting the culture in your staff or organization, and in particular, for setting the ethical foundation for it. On the other hand, when you choose to build a commander-centric organization, it, it is a choice. It doesn't just happen. It must be built. Then you're hanging it out there because it's all on you. Your ethical standards will become the command's ethical standards. And in that respect, your conduct must be above reproach. You live in the fishbowl. There isn't anything that won't be observed on duty or off duty by somebody. And in this day and age, there isn't anything that isn't likely to be filmed. And so 
when you choose to develop, to build a commander-centric organization, with that comes an extra measure of responsibility that says they are going to reflect you and everyone will know that it is a reflection of you. So how do you do that? How do you actually go and build a commander-centric organization? As I mentioned to you, it doesn't just happen. You've got to invest time into it. And the outcome, the value of it is, it is proven through history, not just modern times, that it is the most effective and efficient organizational concept when it comes to fighting and winning wars. So how do you do it? The first thing is you can't hide. You have to be present. You can't hang out in your office. As you look across the international scene, you'll find a broad variation from staff-centric, rare instances of commander-centric, and, and a habit, a comfort zone that says the commanding officer sits on a pedestal, hides in his office, and on occasion makes the big the big decisions simply by announcing them. I would propose that in all likelihood and in most cases in my personal experience, those are staff-centric organizations. So you have to be present. You have to interact with your staff and task force commanders. And the key here is to allow them to get to know you. Develop a relationship with them. It's not an inappropriate relationship. It's not one that's overly familiar. It respects all the rules and regulations about fraternization. But hang it out there. Let them get to know you. Because it's through relationship that we build trust. And the foundation of trust, I propose to you, is your ethical behavior. They're going to see it. And the things that build that ethical foundation are pretty straightforward. Yes means yes, as you interact regularly with your staff and subordinate commanders. Yes means yes, no means no. And because you're interacting with them frequently, they're going to see it vividly. Is there a do say gap? This is what he says, but this is what he does. This is what she says, this is what she does. And so interacting with them allows you to reinforce those basics that build that foundation of trust. And remember, in building this foundation, in building a relationship, and moving forward to do very difficult things in this commander-centric command that's going to go wage war, your objective is not to be liked. Your objective is to be respected. And the best foundation for respect is an ethical foundation along the lines that I just described to you. And oh, by the way, the likelihood is you will be liked. But when we begin to have our preeminent objective of that personal relationship and interaction with staff and subordinate commanders to be liked, then you begin to find yourself on a slippery ethical slope on occasion. Second thing, clearly define and articulate staff and task force roles, functions, authority, and expectations. Don't make your staff and your subordinate commands guess. Clearly define every one of those things. And the basic premise is you already know with responsibility must be commensurate authority. Sometimes we stop there, but go further. Responsibility, authority, resourcing to accomplish your responsibilities, and authority over those resources, and accountability. It's not just two things, it's four. Responsibility, authority, resources, and accountability. Make it clear. And when you distribute or delegate those things, don't fall into the trap that says 
they come automatically with the position, that staff position or that subordinate, subordinate commander's position. That those that are working on your staff or in your subordinate commands must be ready, must be equipped in terms of their experience, their teaching, what they've been taught, to exercise that authority appropriately. And it is legitimate as you contemplate roles and functions and the delegation and assignment of those things to contemplate as one of your decision factors the ethical foundation of that individual. Without an ethical foundation, do you want the ultimate in terms of authority to kill or not to kill, delegated, to employ this element of ROE on a more practical level? Or do you want to withhold that that element of the ROE, which says you can respond to an imminent attack. Do you want to withhold that until that individual is equipped? You have an ethical responsibility to understand the members of your staff and their level of equipping, if you will, and to understand your subordinate commanders and to do that clearly define and articulate roles, functions, and authority in the context of their readiness to do it well because of what we began this morning with. That it is the choices of those individuals that can have strategic consequences. Play the part, inspire confidence. Your subordinates expect you to be calm, confident. I was giggling one day because I was a new four-star commander and I had my NATO hat on. It was a commander, Joint Force Command, Naples. It's the NATO equivalent of a combatant commander. And I was going up to Brussels to have a discussion with the North Atlantic Council. Those are all the ambassadors from the nations that, that make up NATO. And it was really one of those awkward occasions when I was going to come in, I was going to brief them on what was going on in Kosovo because we were the operational level commander in terms of the peace uh, enforcement mission that NATO has ongoing in Kosovo. But at the same time, it was like, how do you like me so far? Because here's what we're doing. But you need to stop micromanaging. You need to stop going around from the political level, ignoring the operational commander, putting political pressure on the tactical commander. Let's get this straightened up. Because the 5,000 kilometer screwdriver with ambassadors doing tactical level work is probably not the best model for success. It was like, I'm Bruce Klingon, how do you like me so far? What did my political advisor advise me? And this is about playing the part. He said, you might be new, but those ambassadors expect you to walk in the room and fill it up with your personality, to fill it up with your knowledge, to fill it up by being a straight shooter that's tactful but direct. Well, interesting because... I tend to be a little bit of an introvert. So it was one of those things going, okay. And it worked. The point is, sometimes playing the part is going to put you out of your comfort zone. But it's important. Inspire confidence. Think about your body language. If you're one of those people that tends to do public grooming, you're just grooming, but your entire staff is going, uh-oh, the boss is nervous. And so think hard about the part that you're expected to play and play it with integrity. In other words, don't be something that you're not, but stretch yourself to play that part so that you can be the most effective leader that you can be. How do you inspire confidence before I leave this point? Righteousness. 
People are confident in you if you're always working through those two lenses that I mentioned to you. Are we doing the right things? Are we doing things right? Because they will gain confidence that that's not only the way you conduct your interactions at the political level, your interactions in managing and leading the operational level of war, but their interactions with them individually, that you're going to treat them righteously as well. And that inspires confidence, particularly when there's no say-do gap. There's no different rule set when you're engaging at the political level, at the operational level with your bosses or colleagues or with subordinates. And so ethics, again, that grounding that says we're going to conduct ourselves daily the way we intend to fight is so important. Fulfill the role, commander, leader, mentor. Don't abrogate any of those three roles as a commander. You need to command, you need to lead, and you need to mentor. They're all important. Now, certainly... Our concept in the United States Navy and the naval profession is that everybody is a leader in their own right, in their role within the organization, and you want to inspire that. That's not what I'm saying. But you lead in the context of your role. You mentor in the context of your role. How often have we heard the chief teaches the ensign? That was true in my case. And the chief teaches the subordinates in terms of the young enlisted men and women. Mentor. And of course, command. As commander, we've touched on that. And so it's okay to have people exercising the authority that you've delegated them. That's not undermining your role as the commander. That's complementing it because we centralize planning and we de decentralize execution. We want people to lead and we want people to mentor. But what happens when you find yourself in a position where you're not equipped? I'll tell you a sea story. Brand new one star Rear Admiral Lower Half Klingon shows up in United States Central Command. We're some significant way through the Afghan OEF conflict where, in fact, I show up at the time when Operation Anaconda is occurring. There's a significant you know, maneuver force on the ground doing some difficult work. And we took lie detector tests and commenced you know, seven days a week, 19 hours a day, literally, uh, a planning effort for Iraqi freedom. Um, but I walked in on my first day into that environment, which I just had a vague kind of awareness of on that first day, and I got a call from General Tommy Franks, and he says, you know, come up and see me, Deputy Director of Operations. So I went up there and I said, wow, this is a great organization. I'm, I'm here two hours. And the boss already wants to say hi, welcome me to the team. This is going to be a great place to work. I walked into the office and he goes, who the heck are you? Well, sir, I'm Admiral Bruce Klingon. I'm your new deputy director. Oh, I need a phase four plan. <laughs> okay, sir, when do you need that by? He didn't look at the calendar. He looked at his watch. <laughs> He said, in about an hour. I went, uh-oh. So I ran down to my staff, which I wasn't even finished getting introduced to. I called the two lead planners, and I said, what's a phase four plan? <laughs> you might not always be prepared to mentor, but under those circumstances, you're going to want to play a role. Ultimately, I had to contribute significantly to the planning effort in phase four in Afghanistan and Iraqi freedom, starting from zero. So don't abrogate that. Dig in, learn as fast as you can, surround yourselves by, with people that can help you bridge that until you're able to fulfill your role. It can be hard work, but it's worth it. Fulfill all three roles.
In this regard, fulfilling the role, don't just model ethical behavior. Teach it. Part of your mentorship should be engaging in difficult topics. And one of them is ethical behavior. It should be on your mentorship list for everybody that you're the mentor for. In other words, it needs refreshing. And it really works good when you talk about dilemmas or challenges that you've faced. Because it brings it home, gets it out of theory and into practice. So be bold and courageous and go, man, I really struggled with this. But don't leave the ethical foundation on the curb. Include it in your mentorship. Manage internal and external friction. There is no such thing. We never have friction in our organizations, right? Wrong. In fact, things can seem swimmingly great, but you put the pressure of combat operations on any organization and the fractures are going to come out with great clarity. And so in peace, discern where the friction is and resolve it. Don't let it fester. And in war, resolve it urgently. Because every ounce of energy that we spend dealing with suffering or perpetrating internal friction is energy not focused on dealing with the enemy. I'll give you an example of internal friction. Again, United States Central Command. And we had planned this effort. We had launched into Operation Iraqi Freedom. We were moving north. And there came to a point where there was an Iraqi army maneuver force. And we had faced with the decision. Do we destroy it? Or do we fix it and bypass? Fix in place and bypass. And there was this discussion about what to do. Ethically, there wasn't an issue about either one. If we destroyed it, which means it ceases to exist, the highest level of, of effect that you can have on a maneuver force, it would, we would hope, and we had reason to believe, demoralize the balance of the armed forces. It had some good things about it in regards to all those forces that we would need when you fix a force in place. You can't just ignore it. You've got to watch it. You've got to be prepared to do something if it tries to break out, either to run away bravely or to engage in your flank. And so ethically, both were legitimate. They had different effects on the campaign. So that wasn't the friction. The friction was that Deputy Director of Operations Admiral Klingon had an opinion about ground operations. Well, you're a Navy Admiral. Your opinion is irrelevant. By all the individuals that had kind of showed up from you know, a small cadre that had done all the planning to, you know, we're going to execute. Now we need a pretty, pretty big team. And so the internal friction was one about service roles. Well, when you're endeavoring to sort out what is the right thing to do, are we doing the right things, and are we doing things right, you've got to be willing to take input from a reasonable cross-section of your organization so that you're making fully informed decisions. That is a hedge against unethical behavior, one that's parochial in the service way or biased in lots of other ways. And so that was an example of internal friction that needed to be resolved and was. There's external friction as well. You know, in, the, in a deployment I did as a battle group commander, we had an air defense warfare commander who was just difficult to work with. It needed to be resolved. 
You know, and the spectrum of resolution goes from relieve him or mentor him. And the really wonderful thing about that event was the other warfare commanders who suffered most of the brunt of that dysfunctionality, along with the staff, said, we're going to surround this guy and help him to succeed. Because they took the time to say, let's try to understand what the root cause of his behavior was. And it, he was out of his league. He could only focus on this much, and it wasn't, I don't care about you. It's just, I can't care about you. I'm not equipped as a leader to be able to deal concurrently with the broad spectrum of things. I'm overwhelmed with my slice, my responsibilities. And so by teamwork and mentorship that helped address those things, we were able to resolve external from the perspective of the staff, for example, and from the perspective of that warfare commander interfaced with lots of other allies and friends and strike groups and things as well. Manage both internal and external friction. Make decisions, own the consequences. Thou shalt never say, my staff did this, or my subordinates did that. You're the commander. Make decisions, own the consequences. And in fact, it is the selflessness that builds trust. And trust is the foundation for combat effectiveness. We need to operate at the speed of trust. And so, be courageous. Make those decisions. Own the consequences. And by the way, when you make bad decisions, confess them, even if the consequences are not big at all. Why? Because it sets a culture that says, ethically, we are always trying to make the best decision possible. Always. It's a matter of habit. We are always working on, are we doing the right things? Are we doing things right? And by saying, ah, I made this decision. The consequences aren't big, but I want you to know this wasn't the right decision. It creates an environment of transparency. And transparency is the best antidote to unethical behavior. Because it is always good to have a wingman, another ship steaming in formation with you, that's going to hold you accountable for making good decisions. And if they don't know you're making decisions, or if they see, well, that was the decision he made, it must be right, he didn't confess it was wrong, then you begin to set a standard. So confess those things. Now, some of you might go, well, if I'm always confessing not good decisions, it's really going to undermine my reputation. It's going to undermine, you know, the view that the commander staff has of me as a leader. There's a risk here, right? But I would propose that if you're always making the wrong decisions, you have two choices. Find a mentor and start up in your game, or raise your hand and go, I'm not equipped. That's a real tough one, isn't it? But ethically, in the naval profession, where the consequences have strategic implications, isn't that our obligation? Now, the wonderful thing about our naval profession is that we do a great job of teaching, coaching, mentoring, training, and equipping people, and selecting the right people for the position. So the likelihood that you're going to need to raise your hand and go, I'm not equipped to take me out, coach, is very, very low. The likelihood that every one of us benefits from a mentor or confidant is very high. It's a good practice, both operationally and ethically. And so with that in mind, those are just a few of the practical actions that you can take to build a commander-centric organization, to build an organization that's, whose culture uh, is proven to be the most effective and efficient in warfare. Next slide. Perspective matters. Sharing your beliefs 
puts your intentions in context. In other words, when all the communications are lost and the fight needs to go on, because they understand what you believe, when they're faced with those circumstances that are unexpected, they're going to be able to go, well, what would the boss do under these circumstances? And because you shared intimately what you believe, the likelihood is they're going to proceed in a manner along the lines that you would have done if the normal command and control was available. So sharing your beliefs puts your direction, your plan, into context. Shared beliefs are a wonderful hedge against ethical failure. So to the extent that in a commander-centric organization, you are the model of ethical foundation, you've built trust, and you have shared beliefs with your subordinates, that's a great hedge against ethical failure. It's also, as I mentioned and began with, it's a great hedge against disruptions to the campaign when, you, when the enemy begins to vote and disrupt. So, what things do you believe are relevant to operational effectiveness and efficiency? The first one is war is political, but we are not. We're an extension of the political. We achieve political ends, if you will, through our armed conflict. But we're not political beings. This came home in a vivid way to me when I was commanding a NATO organization. It was Joint Force Command Lisbon. This was back in the 2008-ish time frame. And Russia invaded Georgia to take Abkhazia and South Ossetia. At that time, our command was the operational commander for the NATO response force. We were responsible for being able to gear up and go do seven missions. Some war fighting, some disaster relief. But the fact of the matter, when this conflict broke out, I immediately called my department heads together in that staff and I said, hey, we're the NATO response force. By the way, this was week one in command. We're the NATO response force. I don't think we're going to be asked to go fight Russia, but we very well could be asked to do something in terms of humanitarian assistance or disaster relief. So we need to pull together a plan. Nine out of ten of my department heads pulled their red card, their soccer red card out and said, we can't plan. What? We can't plan? I said, well, you know, in about an hour, Sakir is going to call me as the commander of the NATO response force and say, Bruce, what can you do? Now, I can figure some stuff out. I'll be able to tell him, you know, we can do this, this. But what I tell him would be much better informed if we worked together collaboratively to harvest the best ideas, by the way, about are we doing the right things? Are we doing things right? That's where the value of collaboration really comes home. And I said, I don't think that's the best approach. We really need to think about this. All of a sudden, nine red cards went back in the park. Oh, we're allowed to think. Okay, then let's get to work on doing some prudent operational thinking. <laughs> Deep, prudent operational thinking. So we got through that circumstance, but there was an element in, culture, in NATO at the time which every staff officer in that command was a megaphone for their nation's political position and did or knew very little about military advice. And so in that regard, we're not political. Now here's the first question for you. I'll pose it and then answer it, and you can pull that thread later in the question session. But 
over the next five years in a series of commands in NATO, I worked hard to beat down this prohibition about planning, using prudent operational thinking as the means. So if you're doing deep, prudent operational thinking, how are you doing on standing on ethical ground? Are you playing a game? Going, well, we're not really planning, but we're, the output is a plan on PowerPoint. So the question was one that I wrestled with going, I will not undermine the ethical foundation upon which I stand and the command stands, but at the same time, it's an imperative that we look at these emerging crises. So what did we do? We began to tout prudent operational thinking as a way to bridge the gap, which it was in reality, between what was provided to us through the training continuum to say, hey, we're absolutely not ready. We are not proficient in crisis response planning or planning, deliberate planning. We don't have the wherewithal in terms of resources within the NATO to provide structured curriculum with, you know, orange, red, blues type scenarios. And so we need to leverage all these crises that are ongoing. And by the way, they're relevant. You, the North Atlantic Council, are going to call me up and ask me to provide the constraints, the restraints, the potential military objectives relevant to giving me a formal planning order. So if you're going to allow me to prepare to give you relevant advice about what you should provide back to me, I need to be able to do that. And so what did we do to stay on the ethical ground? We didn't hide it. We made it absolutely public exactly what we were doing and why we were doing it and gave them an opportunity to say that's still not good enough. We think it's too close to planning. And in fact, they resonated with it. So what's the ethical takeaway? Don't hide stuff. If you feel really strongly about something, then hit it on, head on. You can hit it in a sophisticated way, but don't stretch the truth. Be absolutely concise and factual about what you're doing and why. And then ultimately, if they said, you still can't do it, we would have had to put our pens down. But in fact, over time, we were able, as I mentioned, to change the entire culture. And now we don't plan, but everybody is getting much better at deep, prudent operational thinking. So remember the ethical takeaway. It was ethically an imperative for me to make my staff ready to do what would be expected in a heartbeat from the political level. But there was a constraint in place, and we worked away, our way around that constraint in a very public way giving individuals in the North Atlantic Council a chance to say no. Uh, and in that way, we were able to move forward. War is inevitable. Train the way we fight. I won't go through a history of every place I've gone, but it seems that every place I've gone, there's been a crisis or a conflict. I can stand here today on this stage and say without fear of contradiction that as true as that might have been over my tour of active duty, 37 years, it is more true today and will be throughout the rest of your careers when you look at the trends in the security environment. There's going to be a diversity of crises that's going to stretch us in every way imaginable. So the basic. War is, war is inevitable, train the way we fight, is absolutely important. Now, think about it. If you look at World War II, and you look at aviation, and you look at who was doing the killing, there were thousands of fighter pilots that got zero kills. There were a few fighter pilots 
that got a couple. And then there was these onesies and twosies that were just absolutely lethal. They got the majority of the kills. 30, 35, 40. Look at our special operating forces today. It's the same concept. Big army. But there are some number of men and women that are absolutely lethal. In our naval profession, we need to find those lethal people. We need to put them to work doing what we are all about. And we need to make sure that we put them in positions so that the extent to which they can replicate their ability in your organization, in your ship, in your squadron, in your air wing, in your strike group. That's what training to be ready to do the business is all about. And remember the other thing that we already touched on, and I'll keep hammering this home. We need to conduct ourselves daily the way we intend to fight on an ethical foundation. They were lethal within the rules of engagement. Train the way we fight. Conduct ourselves daily the way we intend to fight on an ethical foundation. No plan. Well, let's not skip war is ugly. War is ugly. War is ugly used to be on the front. But I propose to you that today there is no front. That the front you know, our strategic, our, our national strategy is to fight overseas. Don't let the fight come to the homeland. The fact of the matter is 9-11 caused us to reconsider our national strategy and to understand and appreciate its shortcomings in a modern wo world. I was commanding the USS Carl Vinson on 9-11. A 9-11, marvelous connectivity, right? Airplane hits the first building. We're watching that drama from the bridge 100 miles south of India. We're headed to the Gulf. We thought we were going to just do an around-the-world cruise. We're going to spend some time in the Gulf enforcing the no-fly zone. And we watch this thing unfold. When the second airplane hit that second tower, the young third-class petty officer female, riding on the grease board behind me, burst into tears. Her husband worked in that building. Time and time again through that conflict, you can see the horrors of war globally. And Central Command... At nighttime, this is now during OIF, there was only two people, the deputy director of operations and the deputy intelligence officer on at night. And one night we were sitting there and we were doing scud hunting. And the intelligence guys were working really hard to try to understand, was that a fuel truck in the shadow of that building with those three guys there enjoying a nice moonlit night near the Euphrates? Or was it a Scud missile? The decision was made that it was a Scud missile. We employed a weapon to kill it. And here you are, a thousand miles away, and what we like to tritely say, three screaming alphas. Why do we say that? Because that's how we cope with the ugliness of war. War is ugly. Embrace it, not in a way that's great, but embrace that it's ugly and you must be prepared for it and your subordinates must be prepared for it. And if your colleagues to the left and right in, in the maritime component, air component, land component, they've got to embrace it and be ready and so does your boss. 
work together to prepare for the ugliness of war. Technically, what does that mean? We buy fewer and fewer things, fewer airplanes, fewer ships, and we deal, we expect to win because we're going to use the overmatch of our technology to make up for a shortage in numbers. We can debate the wisdom of that approach, but there is one thing that is absolutely true in that context. And that is, you must be able to technically exploit the entire capability of that weapon system that is your responsibility to operate. You can't be Bruce Klingon and his iPhone where I got this powerful machine in the palm of my hand and I push the little green button to talk to Jamie. You know, what? I can surf the internet from this thing? If your approach to exploiting the technical capability of your weapon system is that, then we're in serious trouble. War is ugly. Make sure that you are technically competent to exploit in all sorts of tactical and operational circumstances the full capability of that weapon system that's entrusted to you. Second, physical. It's physically grueling. Now, we like to think about the man in the foxhole. Yeah, that's physically grueling. But I'll tell you, a year of planning seven days a week, 19 hours a day, ends up being physically grueling. War is physically challenging at every echelon and in every uh, warfare area. So be ready, physically. Emotionally ready. I talked to you already with some sea stories at the beginning of this element about the emotional challenges and we have a wonderful uh, knowledge and growing awareness of all the things that I sum up in that one word. PTSD, for example. PTSD is not new. It's interesting, when I was growing up, my father was a Marine F4U driver. He flew Corsairs off the Jeep carriers during the Korean War. I confess to you, I just thought he was kind of mean. You know, he was, a, he was awkward. And as I began to learn a little bit more, and he didn't share much about the war stories, but he did say, for example, that when he was flying, at one point he had to take 48 hours off from flying because he, he began to laugh hysterically and couldn't stop. Every Marine is a ground pounder first, he went ashore to be a forward air controller, and a Chinese guy jumped in the foxhole next to him, tried to bayonet his best friend, who pulled out at a 45 and shot the guy who fell on top of him. And on his deathbed when I was there, he was in and out of consciousness. And at one point, clear as a bell, 40 years later, he utters, it will be okay. The MiGs will keep them off us. The, MiGs, the Sabres will keep the MiGs off us. Because in that war, the Air Force Sabres engaged the MiGs at high altitude while the Marine Corps F4Us did close air support for the Marines in contact. It will be okay. The Sabres will keep the MiGs off us. He's reliving the trauma of that conflict. We have wonderful work ongoing about resilience and about recognizing PTSD and about getting our colleagues and friends and shipmates hooked up with the help that they need to deal with this fact that war is ugly. Don't ignore it. You have an ethical obligation to take care of your shipmates in that regard. And spiritual readiness. There's a saying that says, there is no atheist in a foxhole. The fact of the matter is the data shows that those with a spiritual foundation endure the horrors of war and are more resilient than others. So, in the context of the constraints that are applied to our naval profession, you can deal with this. The way I used to say it to my shipmates, my subordinates, my commanders was, 
Make your team ready across those four attributes and don't shy away from the last one. When I tell you, and this came from my days in the LSL, when I tell you to shoot downrange and kill that approaching small boat that might have a bomb in it, that is not the time for you to be wondering about what's going to happen to that person when I kill him. Or if he, you miss and he gets there and you're killed, what's going to happen to you? Resolve that issue before you ever get into conflict. One way or the other, it's your choice. But don't shy away from it because it's real. No plan survives first contact. Branches, sequels, think. Planning is the fundamental advantage that we have in the United States above every ally and every potential enemy. We plan well. And the ethical conduct of war begins right when you begin planning. As you're making choices between courses of action, you can think about, well, we can go through the hinterland or we can go through downtown. Where am I most likely to run into the stressors that could cause me to snap and have an ethical failure and commit an atrocity? Out there amongst the cows or in the urban conflict where people are throwing Molotov cocktails and all sorts of ugly things? It starts with co-selection. It also starts in the execution. You know, you need to plan well, identify the risks, and choose wisely. War fighting is not risk free. But what's the point? When you move from the theory of a plan to the execution, you're going to have all sorts of ethical decisions to make. Are you going to continue to bump your head against a plan that isn't making the expected progress? Wasting lives along the way. Or are you going to be willing to change, to branch, or move to a sequel? In other words, plan well, but don't be married to it. And remember, the enemy has a vote. And part of planning is always ROE, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So assess the risks, choose wisely, and assess progress. Don't take unnecessary risks, and don't pay unnecessary costs. That's an element. Are we doing the right things? Are we doing things right? So, GIFMIC. In this particular case, you can say this applies to a JTF commander in a joint context, applies to JIFMIC today because we're at the Navy War College, the Naval War College, we're talking about JIFMIC. But it's important that the JIFMIC work the operational where they're actually commanding and controlling, sitting on top of task forces and task groups, and the strategic. In other words, you want to shape the strategic environment within which you're going to conduct the operational war. And you want to allow your subordinate task force commanders to shape you as the JIFMIC so they would shape the operational and operate in the tactical. Why is this important? Are we doing the right things? Are we doing things right? You want input on that. ROE, a fundamental element of planning and of execution. You ask for the ROE that you think you need to accomplish your mission. Some of it might be withheld until the circumstances merit its application, and then you apply it. I remember a day way, way back when, when we were involved in disciplining Libya, I was an F-14 pilot at the time. We would send a section of F-14s out, and out would come Libyan MiG-21s, and we would get all tangled up in a big dogfight. And the ROE was, you can't assess hostile intent 
even though we could hear that they had authority to fire at us. If they fired at us and hit your wingman, only your wingman could return fire, dot, 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 assuming he was still alive and the airplane was still flying, but you could not. How's that for ROE? Other ROE that we grapple with is how many innocents are you allowed to kill in neutralizing a legitimate military target? These are very difficult decisions, but fundamental to shaping the environment and managing the risk in which you are going to operate. So don't wait like little birds in the nest waiting for manna from heaven or the worm to be put in your mouth. Engage in these difficult conversations in the context of the objectives of the, of the tactical or the operational or the strategic. And be a voice for ethical decision-making as you develop the courses of action and ask for and implement the ROE. Don't fight the scenario. Leadership and courage matter. <laughs> so, how are you feeling these days in the course of reductions in capability, capacity, readiness? Well, they're a fact of life. The underdog does win. And we're not the underdog. May not enjoy quite the overmatch that we might have before. I don't know. But you do in your areas of responsibility, exactly what resources you've been allocated, how they stack up against the threat. But the underdog does win. Because of leadership and courage. And I have yet to see a scenario when we'll be the underdog. It could be tougher than we might like. And so lead. Lead courageously. The ethical perception that your staff, your people have of you is going to multiply the effectiveness of your leadership and courage. If you're viewed to be ethically soft, you'll have a hard time inspiring people in the face of adversity and challenge. Even so, you say the right words and you act courageously. Without that foundation, the ethical foundation and the trust that flows from it, you'll have a much harder time inspiring your men and women to do the really tough things that we have to do under the best circumstances, let alone the circumstances where we might find ourselves stretched thin across the world that's characterized by crisis after crisis of great diversity. However, if your ethic, ethical foundation is strong, you can inspire your men and women to do amazing things. It's real. Next slide. Keys to operational success. Common objectives, synchronization, and decision matrix are three tools. Without common objectives, you can't be sure that your other component commanders, your subordinate task forces, are aligning their efforts to accomplish the same thing. So take the time to specify those objectives and then make sure it penetrates down to the deck plates so everybody understands, here's what we're about and here's how we're going to go do it. The synchronization matrix says, as I go to accomplish that objective, here's the sequence of events. Who's doing what leading up to accomplishing these objectives? And the decision matrix is a tool that says, I want to decide between COA A or COA B. Here's the attributes I should consider to compare the two and decide. 
or a decision matrix on COAs? Should we do out in the hinterland or through the urban center? Are we doing the right things? Are we doing things right? The synchronization matrix is a wonderful tool as a hedge against ethical uh, failure. In other words, why is the 82nd Airborne always going first? Is it because they're equipped to do it? And the risk to mission, risk to force is managed best? Or is it that they're glory hounds? Or is it that someone in the chain of command says, better they get whacked than my favored son or daughter over here? Use synchronization matrix to not only get the campaign or the operation, you know, sequenced well, but also as a perspective to say, how are we doing in terms of sharing the burden of war is ugly? How are we doing in terms of managing the risk? Same with the decision matrix, and I touched on it. It's okay to contemplate the likelihood of ethical failure in COA 1 versus COA 2. Hinterland versus urban is a way of thinking about that. Risk to mission, risk to force, desired effects, drive tasking. This is critical. We want to accomplish our objectives in the most effective and efficient way possible. Get the plan right. And then, if there is some kind of imperative, be it a political imperative or a service imperative, put that on top of it. Fully knowledgeable that you may be undermining the efficiency or effectiveness, but you're doing it for a cause, a reason, that you can articulate. For example, it might be a whole lot easier to go do this operation without involving allies. But it's important to have that Arab face or NATO face, as the case may be, you hear that language on occasion, to sit there and say that there's global solidarity or there's alliance solidarity and it has intrinsic value as opposed to doing it most efficiently and effectively if we shoulder the burden ourselves. But get the plan right and then make those adjustments. The second thing is true as well. Uh, not just an Arab face, for example, but services. You know what? Sometimes it's just okay for the Navy to sit tied up to the pier. We are not the best capability to be used in terms of risk to mission, risk to force, and achieving the desired effects. On the other hand, there may come a time what says, hey, if we don't get the Marine Corps into this fight, you know, then next budget cycle, they're not going to compete very well. And we know that maybe they're not so required in this fight, but they're going to be required amidst all these crises that characterize the security environment later. And so we're going to find a spot for them. But we do it that objectively. So don't force the United States Navy or anybody into it. Start with the most effective and efficient and then make adjustments, understanding exactly what risk you're going to incur as a result. This comes internal to our service as well. So you want to go do something, and you have a choice. And I am going to employ the air wing or TLAM. The aviation tribe or the surface tribe. And what are the budget implications? Don't start there. What, is, how, what does it take to get an air wing into the middle of some place to bomb a target? You gotta roll back the air defenses, you're putting men and women at risk, you were killing a whole lot of enemy that you might not have to because you had to neutralize all that air defense, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas the TLAM pushed the button, let it fly, neutralize the target. So think about the implications of those choices. Seize the initiative. How many of you have been involved in COP2X? 
Okay, you're all worried. Here comes, you know, this is the big graduation exercise. The Orange Forces are arrayed over there. And you're worried. How's this thing going to start? It's supposed to culminate in kinetics, but... And then all of a sudden, some orange guy shoots. And everybody's like worrying, going, well, what if that was a rogue commander? What if he made a mistake? What if that seaman on the button just sneezed and pushed the button? Stop. Cover the enemy, every one of them, when the criteria is met, which you have sorted out in terms of your plan, you know, the ROE, and on that first hostile act, make it a very bad day to be orange. Neutralize every single ship within the law of armed conflict and what you intended to do. Achieve the effects that you need to without hesitation. It's these stutter steps into conflict where bad things happen. We suffer more casualties than we need to. Orange gets a sense that, well, we may not win, but we can really bloody their nose, so we're going to protract this thing. But if you neutralized every one of them at that first shot, then all the rest of Orange goes, wow, maybe we better not do it. Seize the initiative. Simultaneity matters in terms of operational success. Networks, this is how we roll. Started with the SOF. We're trying to find high value targets in Afghanistan and Iraq. So they collect intelligence through all sorts of means. And they build out this network that says, you know, those, those uh, you know, insurgents, here's their network, here's the financer, here's the bomb maker, here's this and that. And one cycle of darkness, we go in there. And we roll up that entire network. We put helicopters on the target. We snatch and grab them. We battlefield interrogate them. We find out that they rat out Dave over there in this other hut. So we go over there and we get Dave too. And by the end of the night, we've kind of hit a dry hole. We've rolled up everybody in the network that we can. And we go back. And we start to remap the remnants of the network. The same applies to us. The sea is nothing but the maneuver space for networks that reside ashore. Networks are the way we roll in warfare. I want to take out that command center that's in the middle of the mountain. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take out the power grid. I'm going to understand the power network and neutralize it. Networks are the way we roll. But at the foundation of it are lots of ethical decisions. Do I take that soft team in helicopters and put them in there at great risk? Where they got to isolate that building, they got to do a door to door knock down, find the guy, booby traps, people that are willing to die for their cause? Or do I kinetically neutralize them by dropping a bomb? Do I drop a 250 pound bomb, which runs the risk that if they're not in the corner of the house that I think they're in, they're going to escape, or a 500-pound bomb which runs the risk that I'm going to kill the neighbors that are innocents. Ethical dilemmas to be sorted out and decided on as you do something as simple as we're going to apply this work at networks are how we break the enemy's will to resist by neutralizing them. Information assuredness, our greatest vulnerability. Think about it. The OIF plan was released in the press before we executed. Think about it. Thumb drives introduced into networks in Afghanistan. Think about it. Snowden. How are you going to deal with that? What does an insider threat look like? Can we go like this and say we're not going to pay attention to it because you know, you're, gu- you're innocent until proven guilty? Or are there leading edge indicators that someone might have a propensity to behave badly? Tough issues that we're dealing with as we look at information assuredness. But again, are we doing things right? Are we doing the right things. Gauge progress holistically. We'd like to do metrics. But guess what? Commanders have the right to use their intuition, their instinct, their knowledge. And here's one for you. 
Oftentimes we have the privilege of intelligence that's credible and not available to our allies. That takes one decision and says, that's not the right thing to do. We need to go over here. How are you going to navigate that? Ethically, you can't release that. This is where I think the foundation of trust that you have established in your command by daily conduct that says, I operate on an ethical foundation. Yes means yes. No means no. When you achieve that trust, you can say, I know it stacks up and looks like we should do A, but we're going to do B. And sometimes you can't even say, because I have intelligence that you don't have, because it would reveal potentially sources and means. Gauge is an important word. Metrics are good, do the best you can, but we are gauging progress. And again, you have an obligation not to bang your head against a plan that's not succeeding. Be willing to change and adapt. And lastly, public perception preeminent in a virtual world. I am utterly convinced that we could stage a conflict in the ethernet with all sorts of reporting and even video and this and that that never occurred and people would begin to behave as if the conflict was real and the outcomes depicted were real. That's how powerful the virtual world is. Public perception of reality plays. And that's why I began the day when I said that our conduct must be above reproach every day because perception is reality. And the reality that the naval profession is an ethical profession amidst all the challenges and dilemmas and difficult decisions that I highlighted to you today. When you move from theory to practice, from ethics as an app that you look up the ethical rule to apply to this circumstance, not, that is not what we do, to the habitual are we doing the right things? Are we doing things right? You can build a public perception and maintain a public perception, and you have the obligation to do so. That says, we, the naval profession, are an ethical profession. We do difficult things in an ugly environment called war, but the ugliness is not caused by us an ethical failure. It is caused by the nature of the endeavor. With that, I'm eager to answer your questions, which I think we have about 15 minutes. Thank you for your attention.